Weddings are chaos. Oh, I know. Like, you see the bride come down the aisle, everything seems to be going great. But every wedding I've been a part of, and I've done a lot of weddings, have like this edge of panic, like laced throughout all of it, where people are just like, man, I just hope it just goes well. You've been there, right? You've been to those weddings. Everybody's like, man, I just hope they don't drop the ring. I hope they don't say the wrong thing. I just hope like that person doesn't show up. Like, I mean, it gets crazy at weddings. My wedding was the same way. Like we thought we had it all figured out. We we're just cruising along. Engagement was super smooth. And then the week of the wedding happened and everything went wrong. I'd sent Tabitha's ring off to get sized, get the wedding band attached to the engagement ring. Guy forgot to send it to us. It was in Memphis. We were in Nashville. I had to drive halfway to Memphis to go pick that thing up. And I was like, this is about as bad as it's going to get, right? Nope, wrong. We had a prayer bench. Thought it would be like really, you know, spiritual have prayer in the middle of the wedding. So we like got a prayer bench. Show up, get it. Like, it's broken. You can't have it. We're like, what? Prayer's broken? Like, what in the world, you know? So we had to go get a different prayer bench. On the night that before we got married, we had a rehearsal dinner and we showed up to do the rehearsal at the church and the entire roof of the building was off. Called Tabitha, I was like, don't freak out. There are 40 people on top of the roof trying to fix it right now. And the roof is completely off. And Tabitha's like, are you kidding me? I'm not getting married to the sound of hammers. But guess what? That morning, 72 and sunny, Perfect day, perfect wedding. It was wonderful. And today we're looking at another wedding that looked like it was going to devolve into chaos. And yet God did something to redeem it. We're studying the story of Jesus turning water into wine. And I know a lot of us Baptists are like, hmm, okay. What's he going to say about that? We'll get into it in just a minute. But today what I want you to hear is that Jesus has the power to transform the hardest moments of our life and make them into something ultimately good. I want you to hear that today. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I'm guessing there's areas of your life that you feel like are on fire or you feel like you're in the middle of a desert or you feel like you're in the darkness wondering if there's ever going to be light again. And my hope today is that you're going to experience the transforming power of Jesus today at the end of the service. So John chapter 2, verse 1 says this. John 2, verse 1. It says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were inviting, invited to the wedding as well. The story is set in the middle of the wedding. And in Jesus' day, their weddings were different than our weddings. Most of us get the whole wedding thing figured out in a day. Like you have it, usually it takes about an hour. The sermon is like 15 minutes max. And then we have a big party and then we're done. But it's just like in a couple hours, whole wedding's done. In Jesus' day, weddings would take over a week. Can you imagine? A whole week. And they would celebrate, they'd have the ceremony, and then they'd have this party and the Groom's family was like responsible for providing all the food and all the entertainment and all the beverages at that party. So it was a huge deal. And these ceremonies often reflected the standing of the couple. If you were a successful couple, if God was blessing you, if you were doing well, you showed it through the wedding. And so they would just show how much God blessed them. And if you had anything go wrong, it usually reflected really poorly on your family. It kind of followed you throughout the rest of your time in whatever town or village or community you were part of. And what I want you to see here is that Jesus isn't the kind of Jesus that stays away from parties. A lot of us think that Jesus was kind of like so spiritual that he just didn't laugh. He was like emo Jesus, kind of brooding all the time in the background, real stern. But Jesus isn't like that. Jesus loves to celebrate. I need you to hear that today, is that Jesus loves to celebrate. He loves being at weddings. He loves to celebrate with people that are celebrating. And he here upholds the beauty and power and majesty of the institution of marriage. You see, marriage is something that God created. It wasn't just something that humans created. They're like, you know, it'd be great if we had like this committed relationship, one man, one woman for life. No, God instituted that. 
God created the very fabric of our relationships and our society. And big piece of that is marriage, where God creates something where one man, one woman come together and say, our life and our stories will be intertwined forever. We're going to make a vow, commitment to be together. And I know that there are many marriages that don't make it, that don't survive the rigors of life. And there are many marriages that struggle. But God's best and his intent is for marriage to be a picture of the gospel. Where God shows his love for us like a bridegroom pursuing his bride. Where ultimately at the end of the story of the scriptures, you find a marriage ceremony happening in heaven, a spiritual marriage between Christ and his church, where he says, you're ultimately mine and no one will ever take you away. And we're going to be one, just like every marriage is supposed to look like. So what you find here is Jesus upholds the traditional view of marriage and carries this out where he's celebrating with this couple. And he's right there in the middle of all of it. And as they're in the middle of their celebration, there's a twist in the plot. The people run out of wine. And that's where our story continues in verse 3. It says this, When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, They don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. So you find the wine running out, and the, the people are in a panic because... This is a massive loss of faith, of honor to the family that's having the ceremony. In, in ancient Near East cultures, you still see this in some third world countries today, other places around the world. There's this honor culture that's really a big deal to people where their, their position and their honor is all that they have and they hold it very closely. And so they really care about trying to keep their honor of their family intact, no matter what. This family's honor was at risk because they didn't have enough to provide for everybody that came to the party. And so Mary comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, they don't have enough wine. And Jesus tries to distance himself from the thing. He goes, what concern of yours is this with me? Like this thing is your concern, Mary, it's not mine. I, I'm not ready to go do anything. He tells her that his time has not yet come, which is an important part for us to understand because Jesus at this point had some followers. He had started raising up some disciples, but he had not done any public miracles yet. He had not done any public miracles. He was keeping a low profile. In fact, there were some people that he had healed, but he had told them, hey, don't tell anybody because he didn't want the word to come out yet that he was who he was. He didn't want to have the crowds following him yet. He wasn't willing to risk conflict with Rome or with the Pharisees and Sadducees yet. He was simply building up his leadership and the disciples that he was teaching. But here he's asked by Mary to do something very public. And we're not really sure what she's asking him to do because it does not seem that she's seen a lot of miraculous things yet from Jesus, but she does know that Jesus is her go-to. She knows that when she has a problem, she can go straight to Jesus. And we all have that person in our life or that technology in our life, right, where we feel like we have a problem, we go right to them. For many of us, it's, it's YouTube. I've started doing this myself. Anytime I have a question and I'm too embarrassed or ashamed to ask somebody else, I'll just go to YouTube and I'll try to figure out all those tutorials and leverage them to my own benefit. For some of you parents, it's math. You're like, common core math. What is that? You learned your one kind of math back in the day, carry the one, do the whole thing. But today they do it differently. So you're like searching YouTube, trying to find like how to do math. I figured out how to do a Rubik's Cube. I was one of those things I never thought I'd ever do. I thought it was too much for me. But then I found that YouTube had tutorials. And one of my kids got a Rubik's Cube for Christmas and I promptly hijacked it from them. I said, I'll figure out how to do that. And I taught myself how to, well, I didn't really teach myself. I copied the directions on YouTube on how to, how to do a Rubik's Cube. And now I can do it. It's like crazy. But it's not often just like, just like YouTube that'll teach us how to do things. Like there are people that are our go-to, right? There, there are people that when we need something, we just go straight to them and say, hey, I need you to fix it. For me, that's my neighbor, Scott. 
Uh, anytime I have something that I'm missing, I'll be like, Scott, help me out. Or if I'm trying to figure out like, you know, if there's some kind of a contractor I need to hire, I'll call Scott. But Scott also helps me out with tools. The weekend, last weekend, I, I had a tree that fell down in my yard, in my backyard, just kind of just toppled over. And I realized I wanted to not spend $1,000 on clearing that thing out. So I was like, I'm going to bow up and be really manly. I'm going to cut this tree up and burn it. So I did that. I went and got my chainsaw out. I started getting ready to use it. And I realized I hadn't used it since I got to Spartanburg. It had been sitting in the back of my garage. Uh, it was even in a plastic bag I had wrapped it in so it wouldn't drip oil all over the stuff that was getting moved. And so I kind of unpacked it, got ready. And I realized that I was missing a key component, which is the wrench that comes with a chainsaw. And I needed to tighten my, my chainsaw belt. Uh, and so I was kind of like freaking out. I didn't want to go back to Home Depot again because I've already been there. And so what did I do? I called Scott. I said, Scott, do you got a, a wrench? I know you probably have a wrench there for a chainsaw. He said, I'll be right over and brought me a brand new chainsaw. I was like, yes, this is great. He said, just use mine. We all have somebody like that in our life, right? Who just like bails us out, always helps us make sure we can succeed. We all have a Scott. Well, Jesus was that for Mary. And Mary knew that he was the provider, that he was the one who could actually answer the problem, figure out what needed to be done. And Jesus tries to like put her off. But she says, anyway, she takes the most mom move ever. And she says to the serpent, she says, just do what he tells you. Basically, was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, okay, guys, just do whatever he wants you to do. Which is probably the best advice you're ever going to hear, right? Do you see in verse 5, she says, do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. That's basically the Christian life wrapped up in one phrase. Being the kind of people who just constantly say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'm just going to do it. I will do whatever you tell me to do. That's what we saw last week where we saw that Jesus, our rabbi, is still alive. Our job is simply to follow in his footsteps, do whatever he wants us to do, and obey. And so Jesus listens to his mother and tells the servants to come with him. Look at me in verse 6. Verse 6, it says, Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them, so they filled them to the brim. And then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. And when the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the groom and told them, everyone sets out the fine wine first, and then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. So what you find here is Jesus doing this miracle. And John tells us that this miracle isn't just any kind of miracle. It's actually a sign. In the book of John that we're studying, John distinguishes miracles from signs. And signs really are things to point us to the very character and nature of who Jesus is. And this sign is actually one of changing water to wine. But Jesus does it in a way that's, that's not what they expect. He tells the servants to go take six jars. There's these large jars that are made of stone. He says, I want you to go take these jars. And I want you to fill them to the brim. And they do. And then Jesus tells the, the, the servants to then take a, a, a cup and fill it with water and then take it to the master of ceremonies, the head waiter at the party. Now, I want you to notice that there doesn't seem to be any kind of like, like ceremony. Jesus simply gathers them together and tells them to fill things with water. And I'm sure the guys who are serving him, the servants are like, okay, isn't there another step? Like, aren't you supposed to like, like make this massive prayer? Or are we like march around them seven times? Or are we supposed to like sprinkle something in there? Like, isn't there a part of the plan that we're missing? But you see the power of God is different than any kind of power. It's simply something that God wills into being. He doesn't have to do any kind of like, like, like spell. He doesn't have to do any kind of ceremony. God changes things simply by his voice and his command. And he's inviting these servants to take a step of faith to obey what God is telling them to do. He doesn't give them all the instructions or tell them how it all works. He simply says, 
dip your cup into that water and then on your way it'll be transformed and it does and when the master of ceremonies receives the wine he's overwhelmed he's surprised he's like what in the world just happened I have never tasted wine like this before in my life. He stops the party and says, everybody usually sets out the best wine first. And then when everybody's a little bit inebriated and they can't tell the difference, then they bring out the shadier stuff. But you guys did the opposite. You brought out the best stuff at the end. And what John is trying to teach us here about Jesus is that Jesus is better. He's better than we can imagine. That's what he's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us how incredible he really is. You see, Jesus gives us a better picture for what, what problem solving really looks like. Sometimes we think like, man, I've got to work really hard at doing the right things. But Jesus offers us a better path forward, which ultimately is letting him take care of the deepest needs of our heart and our deepest problems. And what you find here is that Jesus is revealing his goodness and his favor to these people in overwhelming measure. You know, a lot of times we think about the quality of the wine, right? God gave them the best wine they've ever had through Jesus. Obviously, Jesus does things with excellence. And so he's going to give them great wine. But it's not just quality of wine. It's also quantity. God doesn't just give them quality wine. He gives them a quantity of wine more than they could imagine. And I know a lot of us are, are just kind of thinking like, what does that really mean? Well, let me just kind of put it this way. Have you ever wondered like how much wine was actually made by Jesus? How much wine? Well, the Bible tells us that there were, if you go back in verse six, you see that there were six stone jars of water that were there. And Jesus has them fill them to the brim. And each one of these jars, if you look, says contains 20 or 30 gallons. Now, it's kind of hard to think about like how much that really is like, like in the real world. So I, I asked uh, some guys to help me bring out a visual of like how much wine that really is. Guys, you want to come on out? So I, I didn't find stone jars, but I did find these big plas- uh, like aluminum trash cans. So these are some of our guys on our, on our staff team carrying up these cans. And... And Oscar the Grouch is not inside of one of them, in case you're wondering. Um, now, each one of these is about 30 gallons. And all together, there's 180 gallons represented. So it's hard to do the math because you're not sure exactly how big they are. The Bible says 20, between 20 and 30 gallons. So if we're just going to put that right in the middle, that's 150 gallons of wine that Jesus made. That is 1,000 bottles of wine. That's a lot of wine. So why would God make that much wine? Like, why, why would Jesus do that? I think the point is that Jesus provides for his people and provides for them more than they could ever imagine and better than they could ever imagine. And I think this is important for us because here's what a lot of us do when it comes to God. We think that God is constantly kind of like trying to hold back or just give us the crumbs. We sometimes think that God, God is like, angry with us and doesn't want to bless us. And we almost have to like wrestle with God and and make him do what we want him to do. But what God is revealing here is he's revealing to us that he isn't stingy with his kids. See, God's a perfect father. And every parent in this room knows that that your kids will ask you for stuff all the time. And, And being a good parent, you know what you tell them? You tell them no. Just kidding. What do you do? You want to tell them yes. You care about them. You love your children and you want to give them the very best. In fact, you want them to have a better experience and a better life than you have had. Because that's something God has wired deep within you. This desire to care and love for your kids. And that's what, what's, what God's doing here. He's revealing that he has a heart for his people. And if they, if they trust him, if they simply just come to him and say, God, we need you, he's going to give them more than they could ever imagine, both quality and quantity. He cares for them. He cares for them. And he cares for you. You know, God sees you. He knows you. He wants what's best for you. 
That may not be what you're asking for, but ultimately God cares about you and is for you. He is for you. Let me say it again. God is for you. He cares about you. And so maybe, just maybe, we should be willing to trust him with some of the hardest parts of our life. And if God's able to take care of a party, a wedding, what more would he do for you? You know, you can't get away from the story without realizing that ultimately this is pointing to God's greatest gift, which is Jesus himself. See, every, every story ultimately is about Jesus. And this story in particular points us to Jesus' final miracle. His first sign points to the last sign. The first sign is the water being turned into wine, but his last sign is the resurrection. And all through this passage, you'll see that there is a picture being painted here of what Jesus ultimately offers every single person in this room, which is resurrection with Christ. You see, the, the clay pots that John puts in there, this, 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 this small like extra adjective of the jars that he uses to, to, to do this miracle are actually a picture of the tomb, the, the, the tomb that, that Jesus himself was laid into, which John later goes on to say that it's a stone tomb that a rich man owned that he lent to Jesus. The water is a picture of the stillness of death, it is flat, it is inert, just like death. And that water gets placed into the stone jars symbolizing Jesus after his death being placed into the grave. But Jesus doesn't stay dead, does he? He's resurrected. He is transformed, just like the wine. And wine throughout the entire Old Testament, New Testament, is a picture of life, vitality, and joy. This is why God uses the imagery in Isaiah of his people being his vineyard. There's this connection between life and joy and wine throughout the Old Testament. And so what you're seeing here, Jesus is saying, there's going to be a resurrection happening. So the miracle of the water being turned to wine is simply a picture, a down payment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection he offers you if you trust him. You see, Jesus wants you to trust him. He wants to trust him with his provision. He wants to trust you, trust him with the the claim that he actually is better and knows best for your life. He wants you to be the kind of person who enjoys Jesus, just like Jesus enjoys being in a party and celebrates this wedding. God wants you to enjoy him. But often we're too scared or we're too proud to actually do what Mary did, which is simply come to Jesus and say, I need you. I need you. I, there's a problem. No one can fix it but you. I need you. Can you do something, Jesus? And when we do that, when we come to Jesus and say, I need you, there's something that's unlocked because Jesus is willing to provide. He's willing to step in. He's willing to reveal himself because ultimately when he does, his glory is revealed. If you look with me in verse 11, there's like almost this, this moment where John steps out of the story and kind of uses his narrator voice. He says this, he says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Isn't that cool? He says he revealed his glory. He showed who he was. And as a result, people believed in him. You know, the areas of our life that are a mess, often we feel like we need to hide them and we need to keep them to ourselves and we need to just like soldier on. But those areas of pain are God's platform for his glory. God has given you this thing that you're dealing with, not for you to say, I'm going to be an overcomer, but for you to show that Jesus has overcome. That's what he's doing. And the area that you're feeling the most alone in, the area you're feeling the most vulnerable in, is the area that God wants to use to reveal who he is through your life. Think about it. Your pain can be God's platform 
to proclaim that Jesus Christ is worth it. To your friends, to your neighbors, to your children, the way you process the situation that you're in preaches a sermon about who you're following. So I think the best way we can close today is by having a time where we bring our stuff to God. Just like Mary, who's like, they ran out of wine. No one knows what to do, but actually I do. I'm going to go to Jesus. That's my plan. Just take it to Jesus and ask him to fix it. You might have an area of your life that you just feel like is broken. It's broken down. It's on fire. You're struggling. You don't know what to do with it. And I want to invite you to do the best decision you can possibly make, which is to simply say, I don't have to fix it. I'm going to let Jesus do it. Maybe you've been trying a long time to fix it and you're just tired. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. It's the time to to lay your burden down at Jesus' feet. Maybe it's a season where you've been carrying some shame, just like this family. They felt shame that they ran out of wine. But isn't it amazing that Jesus never runs out? And he's willing to cover your shame with his power. So that everybody goes, wow, there's a better thing out there. You've saved the best for last. So I want to invite you today to just take a time of prayer as we reflect today. I know that some of you carrying a burden and you need prayer. I'm inviting you to come down front and pray if you need prayer. There are people, faithful men and women who love to pray over you. Maybe come with a friend and say, hey, I just need you to come pray with me. Maybe you're carrying the, the weight of a cancer diagnosis or you're feeling alone or you're just feeling like unloved or unseen. Just know that God sees you and he loves you. Maybe you're feeling shame. Today is the day you can break the chains of shame in your life by simply saying, Jesus, we just take it. Today might be a day of hope for you. And I'm inviting you to trust Jesus with your sin, your suffering, or your sorrow, because he's enough. So you're welcome to come as I begin to pray, as we respond through singing, just come and trust Jesus with it because he'll carry it for you. Jesus, today as we come and we respond to this message, God, I pray that we would be the people who say, God, I can't take it. Will you take it for me? Will we be the kind of people who respond and say, God, I'll do whatever it is that you tell me to do. That's what I want. I'll follow you wherever it is you want me to go. God, I pray that we be the kind of people who continue to declare you're better. You're better. You're better than my circumstances. You're better than my pain. You're better and you are for me. And in the midst of it, we would taste and see how good you really are. That you are better and you have both the quantity and the quality to make your glory known in our life. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Thank you for connecting with us today. Please take a minute to share this message with a friend and click subscribe to be notified when we share new uplifting content that'll encourage you and help you grow deeper in your faith. Click the link on the screen to get connected with us and support how God is using this ministry to set the world alight for Jesus Christ. We're praying for you. We'll see you next time.